Good evening. We have a public hearing at 7 o'clock, and that will be followed by the regular meeting of the Committee of the Whole of the Urbana City Council. So I'd like to open the public hearing, and this is about any comments on um, two applicants for G2 uh, licenses which permit video gambling. The first is for um, Trident Partners at Five Points Commercial Center doing business as Ruby's at 510 North Cunningham, suite number five. And the second is for a Class G2 liquor license for SOI LL Soil Restaurant Systems doing business at Dottie's 2740 South Philo Road. So is there anyone who would like to comment on either one of these applications? If you would, please come forward and um, speak into the microphone. Say, please say your name. Yeah, just take a seat there and please speak into the mic. Hi, I'm Jim Rasner. Uh, my family and I own Huey, uh, uh, Poor Boys Restaurant in uh, Five Points. And I think probably all the council members already got a, a letter from me regarding the entire process of uh, approving the, the gaming halls. Uh, our restaurant has uh, four gaming machines in them, and uh, it's helped us with our expenses quite a bit. Uh, these uh, are probably going to hurt our competition. That's the way it works. I don't have anything against it. What I don't like is seeing rules changed for the gaming halls only at the expense of restaurants. Uh, originally, it was supposed to be 500 feet uh, parcel to parcel. That was changed to accommodate someone who came into our uh, strip mall. That still didn't work, so it was dropped from five. It was supposed to be 500 feet parcel to parcel. It was changed to 500 feet door to door. That still didn't work, so since they were only 258 feet from us, so it was changed to 250 feet. Rules get changed. I know that, and I know that the, the city wants to get uh, some money in. What I don't like is that those new rules apply indiscriminately to the gaming halls as opposed to the restaurants. Gaming halls can come in within 250 feet of any restaurant now. If, an, if a restaurant wants to come in next to another restaurant and have gaming machines in them, they still have to be 500 feet. I, don't th I think the restrictions are only between G2s for G G2. Um, licenses, not um, 500 feet between G1s. Well, I'm sorry. Maybe I misread it. Yeah. The other part that I, bothers me is that um, almost all of these, in fact, the two coming in tonight and the one that's close to us called Lacey's, and both tonight are not owned by people in this town. They're one of the ones tonight is owned by a, a consortium out of uh, St. Louis and Edwardsville. Uh, the other two, the one close to us and the other one that's out on Philo Road, are, are both owned by uh, people from Springfield. Uh, these bring, come in, take a lot of money out. I know the city gets some money, but it takes a lot of money from the people in the town, and they hire very little people. We have a typical small restaurant. We hire 15 to 20 people uh, is our typical <coughs> payroll. These places will come in and hire two to four people, period. That's all. So I would like you to have that in mind when you start thinking, let's pack the whole town with these places. It hurts local business, and it's really not good for everybody. Okay. Thank you. Yes, would you, uh, there's a question for you yeah. from Bill Brown. So you said you had four machines. Is that because that's all the space you have, or would you have another one if the, you needed it? Um, four is enough. I mean, that's for, for you space. Do you that's have about all we have room for. We, we could squeeze another one in, but we just stayed with the four. Do you have people waiting for those machines? Occasionally, or? yeah, we've had that. We, have, we originally had just three machines, and we did have people waiting, so we went ahead and put a fourth machine in. Okay. It, didn't, it didn't seem to change a lot, the bottom line, but we don't see people waiting anymore either. Okay, thanks. And uh, thank you for bringing the papers by. I do appreciate that. Any Anybody other else? questions no. for Mr. Resner? Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to testify at this public hearing? Yes? Good evening, everybody. 
Uh, my name is Mauricio Salinas. I am uh, one of the owners of El Oasis here in Five Points. And uh, I, I oppose to um, slot machines or legal licenses because pretty much the uh, Five Points strip mall is a mall with where a lot of family and kids come. And I believe that selling liquor there or having slot machines is going to contradict what the city of Urbana is, uh, meaning that some of us who are local owners are trying to create paths for the kids to go in the right way, the right path, but liquor and gambling I don't think is a way to um, help us. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, El Oasis is giving 50 gift certificates a month to Leal Elementary School for those kids that had been um, attending uh, the whole month with no tardiness or no miss, missing days. We are trying to do this because we wanted to, in combination with the uh, elementary Leal School, trying to fix that little problem that the school has. Having a liquor license or somebody selling alcohol next to us is going to really hurt because kids come and we don't know what kind of people are going to be attending this, this, um, this business. Um, besides, as the other gentleman mentioned, we're local owners and there is other companies coming to our town and pretty much are going to push us out of business. If, if I am to have a business next to a liquor store, I will wait until my contract is done and then move my business somewhere else where there is not a liquor store or a, a gambling a business next to it. Um, that's, that's all I have to say. Okay, um, <coughs> Diane Marlin has a question. Where is your business located? 510 North Cunningham, Unit 14. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Well, if there's no one else who would like to speak at the public hearing, then I will close the public hearing. Thank you all. All right. Uh, the uh, City of Ravenna Council's Committee of the Whole will come to order. Uh, will the clerk please, please call the roll? Mr. Ammons? Here. Mr. Brown? Here. Mr. Jacobson? Here. Mr. Madigan? Here. Ms. Marlin? Here. Mr. Roberts? Here. Mr. Smythe? Here. Mayor Pressing? Here. All right. Are there any additions to the agenda? Uh, any staff reports? Mayor? Um, we've received a couple of awards. We got one from the Champaign County Conservation and Development Association for the Boneyard Creek, and then we got one from the um, Preservation and Conservation Association, PACA. And so Bill Gray and Libby Tyler and I were there yesterday. So people appreciate um, what we've accomplished with beautifying the, the creek. So we also got an award from the Arbor Foundation, uh, a growth award in addition to being a Tree City USA that we've made progress you know, making things even better with our tree program. So I thought that was nice that we got the recognition. So I wanted you to know. All right, thank you. Uh, Diane? I have a report. Um, I serve on the um, Market at the Square Advisory Committee. I just wanted to remind people that the Market at the Square opens this Saturday, starting at 7 a.m., so the 2015 season will begin this weekend. And I also wanted to uh, let people know about a new feature that's, that's operating in conjunction with the market every Thursday afternoon at 4 o'clock, live on Channel 3, WCIA. Our market director, Natalie Kenny Marquez, will be cooking live on screen and she'll be using um, seasonal fruits and vegetables to prepare uh, dishes so every and she's got the first four months I believe mapped out so starting this Thursday four o'clock channel three um, I'd encourage people to tune in and the recipe cards then will be available each weekend at the market that people can follow up and purchase and use Thanks. 
All right. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Is there a motion? <coughs> so moved. Moved by Aaron, seconded by Charlie. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed nay. The ayes have it. Uh, public input. I have a public input card from uh, Bishop King James and the Reverend, Reverend Dr. Evelyn Underwood. Um, they are con uh, continually concerned about the Dr. Ellis subdivision sewer problem. I have a card from Mary Eaton. Uh, the topic is smoking ban. Uh, indicates she does not wish to address the committee but is in opposition and I'm assuming opposition to uh, allowing smoking uh, or in opposition to it being banned. Okay. That was my assumption. I just want to make sure. Um, Jane I'm sorry, I can't read the last name. Woodcock, okay. Uh, smoking ban also uh, in opposition to allowing smoking in the building. Uh, Cheryl Bundy. You want to allow, you want, you're, you're good with smoking. All right, all right, okay, all right. Okay, now I've got one from Cheryl Bundy. Uh, also in opposition, uh, the topic smoking in building. So. Again, you want to be able to smoke in the building. All right. Uh, Patty Greider, uh, smoking ban, does not wish to testify, but is in opposition, uh, again, to banning smoking. Um, Patricia Hubert, uh, does not wish to testify, but is in opposition to banning smoking in the buildings. Judy Thomason uh, does wish to address the committee. So. I'm Judy Thomason. I live at 109 West Illinois, apartment 314. Uh, I used to be a smoker, you can tell. But I am against this banning smoking because these are our homes. And we, none of us that came tonight feel that anyone <coughs> should be telling us what we can do in our homes as long as it's legal. Um, I don't do this very often, I think you can tell. Um, we sign a new lease every year, and our lease says we can smoke, we can drink alcohol. Uh, and they're signed once a year, January through March. And I think these people started complaining way back in December, knowing they were going to be signing new leases. And I don't understand why they would sign a new lease that says you can't smoke. You can smoke there. Um, it's not that we don't care that they have problems. We all have problems. We're all seniors, and we are all disabled people, one or the other. Or some of us have both. Uh, I think it would be too hard to try to move someone out of these buildings because they smoke. And I don't think it's that easy to quit smoking. I took years before I could quit smoking. Um, our smokers in our building are very considerate to everybody else. They don't smoke in your apartment when they know you don't allow smoking in your apartment. They don't try to smoke around you. It's the smoking ashtrays outside are 15 feet away from the entrances, just like Illinois law states. Also, our management has put air purifiers on the third floor and the fifth floor, which have taken the smoking smell out of our hallways. Uh, I found out our ventilation system pulls the air. We have fans on the top of our roof. It pulls the air completely up and out of our building in those vents. I never smell smoke in my apartment. I have a smoker on both sides where I am and I don't smell it. I have smokers underneath me and above me. I do not smell smoking. I even had Esther P 
expat come over and walk through the hallways with me. It's something I had never done. I've been there almost four years. She walked with me so we could find out why people were complaining so bad now that all these things have been fixed in our, par in our hallways and where the smokers are. We have 14 smokers plus uh, two people on this smoking ban that signed for the ban are smokers. One I know did it because the guy she lives with, we only have one apartment where there's two people in it. And he cannot, he uses oxygen, so she has to go outside. The other one smokes, but tries to tell people he doesn't. Um, one has moved out, and there's another lady that signed it. Nobody knows who she is. She's not a tenant in our building. Um, <coughs> Management has also ordered new door sweeps for anybody that didn't have them. And a lot of the complainers don't have door sweeps under their doors as of April 8th when Esther went walking with me. Uh, and like I say, we're, moving is not an option for people that are old. Some of them don't even come out of their apartments to go downstairs and eat at a party with us. We take food to them. That's all I can think of saying, other than it's our home. Okay, thank you. All right, is there anyone else wishing to address the Committee of the Whole? All right, then we'll move on to uh, agenda item number five. Uh, proposed ordinance approving the Champaign-Urbana Solid Waste Disposal System Annual Budget, FY 15-16. <coughs> Hi, I'm uh, Brad Bennett. I'm assistant city engineer uh, in the engineering division, and I'll try to keep it short and sweet on the Cuspers budget. But what you got before you tonight is the operational budget that was set for the upcoming fiscal year for the Cuspers, which is our closed landfill site. It's out at the landscape recycling facility. Um, you can see we've got budgeted for this year uh, $46,987. The uh, costs are shared between the city of Urbana, the city of Champaign, and the University of Illinois. Uh, those costs cover mostly um, maintenance activities out at the landfill um, and uh, monitoring activities. We have a number of groundwater wells that we monitor as well as surface water uh, to make sure that there is no contamination occurring to the environment or adjacent properties. And I'm pleased to report for another year we haven't detected any contamination. So. I guess at this point I'll open up if anyone has any questions about the the budget bill. Okay. Um, just I, I noticed that the post closure activities go on for 30 years ending November 2018. So then it won't be funded anymore. Will there be anything left to do at that point? Will we have to keep doing something even though we don't have any partners left? Well, the agreement was with adjacent property owners. That is called the Hoseman Agreement, and you're correct. That does expire in 2018. Um, I don't know if we'll necessarily stop activities out there. I think it would be prudent for the city to continue to, to monitor. We may be able to reduce the expenditures at the end of the Hoseman Agreement and not monitor as many wells, but we'll probably you know, want to continue to make sure that we're not getting any environmental contamination or affecting any adjacent properties, at least to some extent, but we might be able to limit it. Okay, thanks. Uh, Charlie? Yeah, Brad, um, and if those of you noticed at uh, the end of the, the um, memo here um, I attended in place of the mayor um, as she was out of town and uh, one of the issues that came up and and uh, Dorothy David raised it was um, long-term budgeting uh, for for the site uh, planning a little more carefully uh, looking at some past expenditures because it s tended to go a little bit up and down depending on what needs to be done and with respect to the closure to um, uh, or the ending of the agreement it, it may very well be that only so many wells will need to be monitored, but wells have to be replaced every so often and things like that. So, Brad, have you had any time to start playing with, you know, a long-term sort of picture of the budget and, and what it's going to need? Uh, no, we haven't had an opportunity to start on that yet. I'll be working, Nick Snyder is our hydrogeologist, so I'll be working with him. But we'll probably start um, 
later in the summer, early in the fall, kind of as part of that budgetary process for next year. Okay. So, so you will, you know, so it'll probably be changing in answer to Bill's question, and probably rightly so. Maybe a little less expensive, if we're lucky. Eric, it's peripheral to the direct, um, the direct decision tonight. But do you notice? any reduction in the flow of materials to the landfill associated with some success in recycling? Well, this is actually a closed landfill. It's actually been closed since the ah, 70s. Yeah, okay. it's, where, it's basically where the landscape recycling facility is. Oh, okay. So we're just keeping an eye on it, make sure, you know, there's no new materials going into it, but just to make sure nothing's leaking out of it. Okay. Charlie? Move to send the council the recommendation for approval. A second. All right, it's been moved by Charlie and seconded by Dennis. Uh, I do have a couple of questions, though. Okay. Um, and I know the costs for this kind of thing go up and down. Um, well, it's clear by the by the graph you have, or by the, uh, the budget you have laid out here. I was just looking specifically at operations. Uh, mm -hmm. We're looking at a 104% increase, uh, actual 1314 over proposed. Uh, yep. We have professional services, 66% over actual to proposed, and we have contractual, about an 80% increase actual to proposed. Just wondering what, is there something going on there? Or? Yeah, on the contractual side, um, we had two significant expenditures that, that hit last year. The first was we put in a pumping system to actually pump leachate out of the landfill and into the uh, uh, sewer system the sanitary district then treats it for us so I mean that was over a fifty thousand dollar expenditure in the past we had actually paid to bring in a tanker truck and actually pump out of the the leachate recovery well into the truck which was kind of a time-consuming expensive process in itself but this new mm -hmm. system is actually solar powered pump and it's all piped up and no one actually has to be there while it's pumping and then we also put in another groundwater uh, monitoring well um, on site um, as kind of an additional uh, observation point. So those two expenses, and they were originally actually budgeted, I think, in 2013 and 14, but due to some timing delays, the actual projects didn't occur to 14, 15. So I wasn't looking at 14, 15. I was looking 13, 14 to 15, 16. <coughs> so your actual in 13, 14. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, because I was, a, I mean, you talked to us last year about the, the big expenditure and the mm -hmm. necessity of that, and it all made sense to me. But I'm just looking at specifically like the 5500 for contractual in 1314 actual, uh, but now you're budgeting 10000 Yeah, we're actually looking at trying to expand our maintenance activities out there. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we haven't done in the last couple of years is woody growth removal, so taking out trees and brush that grow up on the landfill and we'd like to get into an annual mowing program. Um, we also have a little bit of grading and erosion control work that we need to address out on the, on the uh, landfill phase. I mean, the idea is, you know, over time, <clears throat> uh, if you don't take care of these items, you can see a deg degradation in the, in the landfill. So there, there always is gonna be a certain amount of maintenance <clears throat> associated with the facility. Sure. Okay. Well, I was just curious about why that was almost doubling. Mm -hmm. um, and then the water sampling analysis, I mean, that's doubling over 14. Uh, yeah, and you can see there's actually a, a $2,500 increase just from last year to this year. And that has to do with, with the new leachate pumping facility. We have to do some additional amount of sampling with that for the sanitary district. Um, in order for them to accept it and treat it and dispose it. So um, those numbers were bumped up. But I think probably the biggest difference for the cost between 13, 14, and 14, 15 is uh, we typically do a three year contract for those services. And in fact, I'm getting ready to put the contract out right now. So you might actually see a, a bump up a, again in uh, 16, 17. So uh, in between 13, 14, 14, 15, a new contract. Uh, or the you know the contracts changed out so you know there were probably was an increase in the in the in the cost between the two contracts the old one and the new one is that something that's um, competitive or is it just pretty much one company no it was competitively bid in fact I think we actually had four bidders on it okay Dennis uh, so what so one of the things you mentioned uh, I want to ask about 
uh, you're doing some uh, woody growth removal on the landfill. Uh, wouldn't it actually be more like ecologically um, useful or something to have uh, forest growth or you know uh, vegetative growth capping the landfill? Maybe uh, is that not preferred? Is that not good landfill management? Will this always be like a bare landfill? Well, I mean, it, it's not a bare landfill. I mean, they've actually got a pretty good prairie species growing on top of it now. Mm -hmm. um, they are actually doing some experimental work. Um, looking at planting trees on landfills to actually suck up some of the leachate as opposed to like we do we collect it and send it to the sanitary district for treatment but that's kind of still in the experimental phases uh, right now the current you know EPA um, recommendation is to keep woody growth off the landfill usually there's a two foot thick clay cap over the waste and the idea is you don't want the tree roots to be penetrating and breaking that clay cap mm -hmm. and allowing water to get down into the to the refuse so usually they they uh, discourage woody growth. Like, but like I said, they are actually doing some experiments, I think with some hybrid poplar trees and stuff, actually looking at that as a treatment option for the, for the leachate. But it's kind of experimental at this point. Uh, surprising. OK, thanks. All right. So it's been moved and seconded uh, to uh, send uh, to send ordinance number 2015-04-037 an ordinance approving the Champaign-Urbana Solid Waste Disposal System Annual Budget FY1516 on to council with a recommendation for approval. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay, and the ayes have it. Thank you. Do you want our? No, you want to repeat that again? Maybe you read the wrong, wrong number. Yeah. Oh, this is newer. From okay, here. this was the last one I got on email. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Here it is. Can I have a new agenda? Yeah. Might, this guy might need a new agenda. Nope. There's some in the back room. That's where I just got mine. Let's try that again. Uh, well, the one that was mailed to me. I didn't even get an agenda on mine. All right. I do have one now. I picked one up in the back of the room. So let's try that again. Resolution number 2015-04-021R, a resolution approving the Champaign Urbana Solid Waste Disposal System Annual Budget, FY 2015-2016. All those, uh, the motion has been made and seconded to forward this to the council with uh, recommendation for approval. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay, and the ayes have it. Uh, so next up we have ordinance number 2015-04-038, an ordinance approving a redevelopment agreement, first amended and restated with Frasca Associates, 906 and 1402 East Airport Road. Libby? Good evening. This is an amendment to an agreement, a redevelopment agreement that was passed back in December 2012. And the amendments pertain to the timeline, uh, which would now extend through September 2017, coinciding with the IDOT grant that was obtained in conjunction with this agreement. Also, um, adjustments have been made to the project description um, including the phase three project, which is the one that is being worked on currently. Uh, fiscal impact would remain as it was assessed back in 2012. Any questions? Uh, Diane? Um, one of the terms of the agreement is that the company would make, quote, reasonable efforts, end quote, to uh, develop 40 new jobs. Do you have an idea how many new jobs have been created since this development agreement went into effect in 2012? Um, those efforts are underway. I don't have an exact number today, but I know that they are in recruitment mode and um, have every anticipation that they will make those, easily make those jobs, so. Okay. Uh, Bill? Um. <coughs> So I, I understand the main advantage is to get this road built and 
hopefully in the future there'd be some kind of industrial park development there. There's several high-tech firms already in the area. Um, I'm a little confused why the runway needs to be demolished. I know they aren't using it and that, um, you know, they, they uh, apparently had liability insurance expenses that were, were more than expected. But is that a potential asset that some future industrial park might find attractive? Does that improve the value of the land by not having a runway on there? I'm not sure why that would be part of it. Yeah, that's probably hard to speculate that it could be reused. I think it's a desire to um, reduce the amount of impermeable land on the property. Um, I don't know if we have an industry representative tonight, but that's my understanding, to reduce the amount of impermeable pavement on the property. I guess um, I understand the, the cost to them because of our stormwater fee for that. Um, if it would be an asset to the potential redevelopment or potential development in, um, in the future of the industrial park or, or even potentially an asset, and um, I would rather see the money not spent on destruction of the runway. I'd rather see it marketed on or used for marketing the property, and I'd be willing to um, make an exception for runways within the city limits of Urbana that we wouldn't have to pay the stormwater fee if, if that's the only thing that wants them to get rid of it. I think you're ringing, Evelyn. <laughs> Anyone else? Dennis? Yeah, so it sounds like, it seemed like that uh, the, uh, the amount of um, construction or um, expansion wasn't quite what was originally a imagined and so are, um, is the city a little bit disappointed in the fact that the uh, the building wasn't enlarged to the degree that we originally thought I think that there was um, this uh, project happened a little slower and they had some setbacks but now it's back on track and I think that the um, reconfiguration of the project that's described is satisfactory to the city and they're meeting their goals and uh, attracting those jobs and helping the city in accessing funds for a road improvement that's been in our comprehensive plan and in prior agreements for some time. Um, it is a important company um, and they have very good jobs and they are expanding and that was the goal of the agreement. The amendments are more qualitative than they are quantitative. The timeline um, is still consistent with the state imposed timeline. We would love to see more projects like this in this area and we would love to see more benefit to the road improvement as well. This is maybe the first step, and we would we would love to work with Fresca on developing more of their um, major land holdings that they have in North Urbana. So this is this is the first step. Hopefully, in doing that, we would love to also see further development in the area, including <coughs> the redevelopment of the Anford Insight and the uh, Pickerel Farm, which could be a combined development site. Of course, I realize that's on the east side of Cunningham. On the west side of Cunningham, where Farm and Fleet is, there are a number of potentially subdividable commercial lots that could be developed and would benefit from this road improvement. So yes, we'd always <laughs> like more, but this, this is a first, a first step in expanding the job base in this part of Urbana and we hope that there will be many others to follow. Uh, okay, that, and, I, and I totally appreciate we want to see this develop. If we if we uh, approve the um, $425,000 property tax rebate over this period, uh, what will we do if they come back, or if there's if they come back, say in like four years, and they have a proposal for, you know, an outlot redevelopment? Are we going to? Is this going to? Uh, would that affect any future development affect um, this agreement 
would we be entering yet another agreement for further future tax rebates? Are we gonna, I, I guess what I'm wondering about is, are they gonna double up in the future well, if there's continued development? I think what happens with these redevelopment areas is the first ones to participate maybe get a higher boost from the government, from the TIF district. So certainly O'Brien's was a major anchor to get this going. And then um, Farm and Fleet was part of that initial deal. Mm -hmm. And we've had, north of the interstate, we've had very few redevelopment agreements. At some point, the economy is strong enough and um, the TIF gets towards the end of its life and you're not going to see as many redevelopment agreements or perhaps the funds aren't there to, to have the same redevelopment agreement. So this is uh, still fairly early in the TIF district. The road improvement is going to benefit many other properties. But um, it's just like maybe somewhat in our, in our downtown. There are major projects that we participate in. The types of projects have changed over time. I think in TIF 4, just because there's a redevelopment agreement with one employer that does not guarantee that there will be the same type of agreement for another project. We are still on the stages of trying to get this redevelopment area going. So um, we look at each development agreement case by case on its own terms. We do have some small programs that we administer um, just in the staff, and those are as the funds are available. So we would likely provide those to, say, uh, smaller projects or business relocations things of that nature. I know there was, a, we've also had other projects that, that have benefited Sucker Planet, uh, Michelle's Bridal, and mm -hmm. Creative Thermal Solutions. Mm -hmm. And those are a little bit, kind of a little bit to the south and west of this particular location. So we've seen some good activity, but hopefully this will bring us more along the airport road. Uh, Eric? Um, do we have a precedent for making uh, tax rebate agreements conditional on an expected level of job creation, or uh, is is that is that ever done? I'm, I don't, I, you know, it's not my area of deep expertise. So, but obviously the context of the question is, would that be appropriate here, or is that just not done? Well, the reason we are looking at the job creation here is because of the EDP grant. Mm -hmm. That's a requirement for the grant. Uh, but typically, we would look at um, the whole package. But um, first and foremost would be added tax base. That's, that's the goal of the TIF, is to add tax base either by improving um, properties that are devalued or building new, mm -hmm. which is optimal. But in addition, as you see in our memos, we look at job creation, we look at sales tax, hotel motel tax, um, economic vitality, um, adding an industry or type of business that has been a target for us. So those are all part of that fiscal analysis piece that, that we do, again, case by case. But, but I, I guess my fundamental question is, is, is it ever done, is it appropriate to do uh, to, to make uh, the actual provision of tax rebates in the, f in the, uh, in the forthcoming years in some sense uh, dependent on some performance measures? Or, do, or, or is that just, you, you just, this, this, you, you hope for that, you expect that, but there aren't really consequences if that doesn't happen? Well, there are performance measures for the TIF agreements because it's a percentage of the increment that's built. So that's the guarantee. That's the source of the funds. So that's really what we like to look at is the property tax increase that's generated by a project. Bill? Um, I was wondering how this interacts uh, with the enterprise zone. They're, are they currently in the old enterprise zone? I'm not okay. Not sure. It's very extensive, but I can. I think I can answer your question regardless. When you overlay TIF and enterprise, the TIF is um, takes over in terms of property tax. 
um, benefits. However, the sales tax benefit for being in an enterprise zone remains the um, sales tax exemption on building materials. Okay. But you can't layer them. Right. Um, maybe they some counties do, tax. but Champaign County will not allow that. So the TIF takes precedence. So then, um, and I do, I do think it's enterprise zone because I believe they've come in for those certificates. Okay. So they finished phase one at the end of 2012, I think. And I was wondering if there'd been any payments to them, rebates. I didn't see any evidence that it, they'd received any payments. In our budget, I didn't see it. Do you I, ha do you I'll have to look, okay. and I can I can get that for next. Okay, week. thanks, Aaron. So, Libby, you talked about the number of jobs, or we've asked about the number of jobs, and you said that they were good quality jobs. Do we know how much do they pay? I mean, how do we know what makes them good jobs? I think there is more information on the jobs in the EDP application. But, um, you know, I'm monitoring the kind of the economic um, conditions of our community. Um, I do look at the wanted ads sometimes, and not looking for planner jobs, but um, they, are, they are very attractive jobs that they advertise uh, locally. They're technical, they're skilled, um, engineering, um, administrative, so they're on a, you could, until they're on a par with the university hires that we have as well. Um, and I've toured the facility. Um, hopefully council members have been able to do that. And they have all the different shops and it's all custom made work that they do. And it, it's very impressive. And I think um, just by its very nature of the flight simulators, those are highly skilled jobs. And you, you can tell the culture of the company family-owned company um, just seems like a great place to work and people uh, work there for a long time so I would just urge a visit to the facility and a tour and and then you you would see you know, what a quality um, employer they are for Urbana and their reach is international it's very impressive what they're doing okay thank you Diane I would second that. I've toured the facility, and um, they hire highly trained professional um, people for the most part. And they're 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 um, many University of Illinois graduates. But but yes, it's it's high, highly skilled jobs. So with I, that, I would move Ordinance Number Twenty Fifteen Dash Zero Four Dash Zero Three Eight to Council with a recommendation for approval. Okay, moved by Diane and seconded by Charlie. Uh, is there any further discussion? Bill? Yeah, I, I agree. They're a high-quality employer, and there's I think they have 180 or 190 jobs there. They're um, Probably almost all of them require college degrees. I know some people that I went to school with ended up working there. Um, and also Creative Thermal has high-quality jobs and right down the road. And then um, Anderson APL, that's another um, high-tech materials. Um, division with their headquarters there. I think they have 50 or 100 high quality jobs. They provide, I think, 80% of all the materials in the, the lighting that lights up sports stadiums, the, the, high, the high tech um, coating materials, the metallic materials. Um, so I think that there's, and I, I think that whole area is attractive for that reason. There's, we have the research park that kind of is, is research only, but it's nice for people who graduate, one of our natural resources here is, is our college um, graduates. <laughs> and it's nice when they can actually find jobs in the area. And that's one, one good place where they can work. But um, So I just um, follow, follow up again on the, the runway. I'm, I know runways um, can be repurposed or used in emergency situations. And I'd hate to see a, a permanent loss of a runway that may have some future purpose unless there's a good reason for it. Um, so I just want to check and, and again emphasize that I would be willing to forego the stormwater fee off the runway surface, which is large. It's a, it's a large runway, 3,500 3, feet or so. Um, so it, there's probably more concrete in that runway or as much concrete in that runway as we'll be putting down for the road. Um, so I think it's something to look into to make sure that that's really what they want to do. We can do that. Thanks. Any further discussion? All right. Uh, so it's been moved and seconded. Uh,
to send ordinance number 2015-04-038, an uh, ordinance approving redevelopment agreement first amended and restated with Frasca and Associates, 902 and 14, 906 and 1402 East Airport Road. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed nay, and the ayes have it. So agenda item number seven is ordinance number 2015-04-040, an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 14, Section 14-7, regarding schedule of fees, subsections B through P, licenses and permits, excluding liquor. Go ahead. Um, my name is Beth Beatty, and I'm the Administrative Services Manager in the Finance Office. No, you're good? Okay. I don't know who she is. Um, the memo, I'm not going to read through it, but uh, this is the annual review of the fee schedule. Uh, staff uh, put it together. On kind of with our proposed fees based off of uh, the cost and um, things that might be necessary off of projections made by work performed um, and other related services that it takes to provide uh, the type of fee that we charge. So I'll just open it up for questions or comments. Anyone have any questions or comments? Yeah. Diane. Um, every year when we get the budget, I always look at the Civic Center and the parking garage, and I wonder, um, are we making money, losing money, or are those facilities revenue neutral? And it's hard to tell anymore. <laughs> it's hard to tell anymore from the budget. Um, our, so uh, item 10 is Civic Center, and I know you've changed some of the, the fees for that. What are the operating expenses versus the revenues in that center? And and are we planning on taking a look at the use of that facility? Are we using it the best that it can be used? Could it be repurposed for other things to serve the city? Is it time to look at that as a as a just a standalone entity? I, I think these increases were recommended by Public Works to get the facility to a break-even point, but I expect Bill could probably answer some of your questions much well, better than It I helps can. recover some of the costs, mm -hmm. but not apparently not all. So. The last um, <clears throat> fiscal year, we broke about even on the Civic Center. Um, and I think the year before that, it was close to a break even, too, with revenues and expenses. Um, <clears throat> so the increases are to try to keep pace <clears throat> to stay uh, neutral for the Civic Center. Uh, the parking deck, I cannot give you the exact um, cost uh, expenses versus revenue, but it's safe to say that w the expenses exceed, far exceed the revenues generated at the parking deck. Far exceed? So is that something we'll be looking at before too long? Generally, we've treated the MVPS as an entire system, not separated out the parking deck per se. That's how we've done it traditionally in the past, but it's other revenues that have helped um, for example, we're looking at probably $500,000 in maintenance and repairs in the next 12 months at the deck. So uh, that's just something that happens pretty much every 10 years to keep that facility uh, in good shape. I would say that I think at some point in time here before too long, we're going to have to look at parking fees as a whole. I don't think that time is now. Um, we're actually looking into implementing a pay-by-sell system similar to what Champaign is doing, which will make it much easier for our customers to pay parking fees. And so I think, you know, strategically it probably makes sense if we're going to talk about increases in parking fees to do it after we've implemented that change. Because it, it, it just makes less and less sense to be charging 25 cents an hour to park in an indoor facility and paying somebody to collect quarters from people. So It's a very good deal. <laughs> it's a very good deal. Okay, my other question then is regarding, and I think I brought this up during our budget meeting, was the rental registration fee. 
which was increased about a year and a half ago with the intent of hiring a third inspector and that has not happened and we've been told that probably won't happen so um, can someone comment on that on page eight and nine oh. on the um, any changes to that program I think we'll be discussing in the budget presentation uh, we did have the three positions filled and then lost right. one of the um, one of the employees and now we're looking at some automated systems as well as some agreements for services so we'll have more information um, at the budget, but uh, we want to be able to keep providing the level of service that's indicated by these fees. Well, I just want to make sure that, I mean, when we raised this fee, it was specifically, we told the public it was to pay for a third person to, you know, shorten the inspection cycle and provide better service. So if we're not hiring a third person, then I think we need we owe it to the public to demonstrate how that extra money that's being collected is being used to provide the extra level of service that was promised. Or if we're not, then, then you know, we should, how can we justify this extra fee? We'll um, have a presentation at budget time on an approach that hopefully we can have a third position and more automation and get that level back. That's the plan. But we do have a vacancy now. and. Um, that we might retool the vacancy, but I agree with you that we do need the bodies to do the work. That is a plan. Um, the position that we had devised uh, probably needs to be modified. But I don't have all the information tonight to present. Okay. However, we'll do that definitely for the budget. Okay, thanks. Kay. Dennis? Yeah. Could you uh, clarify a little bit for me the um, changes in the um, public television access fees? That's on page six. It looks like uh, a lot of um, particular costs that people would have in, in using the, uh, the services are being scratched and we're going down to a basic uh, in-state membership and out-of-state membership. And can I ask, is it should be in-city and out-city? Or why is it state? Uh, this was just the direction from the IT director who supervises UPTV and their staff. Um, I don't really know more than that. The other, with the fee in regards to decreasing, they're just getting rid of first hour and the second additional hour at a different cost and just making it a flat fee for $50 per hour. And I would imagine that's just to cover cost. Same okay. with the DVD creation charge. Mm -hmm. And, it, and is this is it um, is the wording in-state membership and out-state membership is that pertain to the city of Urbana? Why are we talking about the state? Is that a, a typo, perhaps? I, I don't, don't think it's a typo, but we could get some clarification on for you on why it was recommended that way. Okay. I, I will say that um, the amount of revenue we receive from these fees is very minimal. Yeah. So my understanding is that very few people are actually paying these fees. Right, okay. Still, it's nice to have things um, correct if they're not correct. Aaron? So under the vehicle for hire, um, we increased them just maybe two and a half, three years ago. And why is it like almost, almost doubling? What, what is there a, I understand if you're just trying to to break even in the cost and, uh, and what we're to, to do business, so to speak, but that's a pretty significant increase. So in my memo, um, staff reviewed the cost associated with the licensing of the vehicles for hire, uh, the businesses and the drivers, and estimated that this cost was about $29,000 annually, which included staff time and benefits. Uh, the fees that we are currently collecting are not offsetting uh, the personnel costs involved uh, with the license-related activities. And for this reason, this is why staff has recommended these significant increases. So how does this, um, so every person who wants to uh, do the vehicle for hire would have to pay 
individually as well as I'm just trying to see how much of this is a company cost or is all this individual cost? Um, well, there's a business fee that's being increased, which is uh, to the company. So it, that's the hundred thirty-two forty, right? That's correct. And then a business owner would also, um, instead of paying fifty dollars per vehicle that they wish to license, they would pay seventy-five dollars per vehicle. And then the, the drivers, whether the business is paying for that or the individual driver is paying for that, it would increase twenty to forty-five. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Wow. Uh, I had a couple questions. Okay. Go ahead. So um, I noticed under the fiscal impact section here, uh, we're talking about. Um, within this document estimating about 251000 in additional revenue to the city. Uh, and then uh, there are going to be further recommendations um, that will raise that overall uh, tax and fee increase in aggregate to roughly $1.1 million for this year. Okay. I, this is probably more commentary than a question, but um, I raised this last year and I just, I, I'm going to I'm going to re up it. I I don't necessarily think it's um appropriate to have Beth come here and uh sit in the seat uh when a bunch of people um the the folks who are running the departments um give her the information and then um and then they're not not maybe here or able or ready to justify those and I know that there's ongoing discussions about fees and 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 budgets um, you know and the re the revenue to pay uh, for the city's expenses but um, basically we're being handled handed um, a, a list of fee increases with precious little information uh, or ability to ask questions um, and I like I say I know that there's going to be more discussion down the road but here's my other kind of fundamental problem with this process here we are talking about fee and tax increases on the front end before we even decide what our budget's going to be. And I think it ought to, frankly, be the other way around. And I know there's a timing thing, a 30-day thing and all that. Well, maybe we ought to back up the budget process because I think we ought to figure out what we need, what we need to spend prior, uh, what we're willing to spend prior to uh, not, not sticking it to the taxpayers first and then uh, deciding how to allocate the money. Um, so, I mean, that's just kind of my uh, commentary on this. I think it's, I just, I, I think it's a bit of a backwards process, uh, uh, frankly. Yeah, Mayor. Yeah, we went over um, the big picture, I think, already. Mm -hmm. So these fees are not being done first. They're being done in the context of what it would take to balance our budget where we are now, what we've committed to in wages. So we had a combination of budget cuts and revenue increases. And so mm. we are looking at both simultaneously. I think it's also important, though, to, to, to in this exercise, maybe uh, for the council to have a little better understanding of what's going on in the departments in terms of trying to cut costs and, and increase efficiencies. Uh, it's more about, it's just, general comments about, hey, things cost more, so we need to raise taxes and fees. I get all that. Um, but, you know, we, we don't hear a whole lot about what's going on to, to, to actually um, create some more efficiency. We've, we've made the cuts. We've asked all the departments to make cuts, and so you'll have a, a list of all those. We, we outlined what the total should be and what we needed in new revenue, and then we okay. started to fill in the gaps, okay? okay? So you will have absolute, you'll have department heads up here, and you can ask them about where they made the cuts, and we'll have a summary of all the cuts, which we did in past years. I think we itemized all the cuts, and we itemized all the revenue increases, and that's how we balance the budget. But I guess that comes after we. Well, no, I mean, it's a continue. When we start, we, we start with those totals and we see how we can balance it. And this was, um, you know, a combination of 
budget cuts and revenue increases. So the two are very much connected. Okay, and I, let me let me say I do really appreciate uh, the fact that we're going to start getting more financial information. <coughs> I think that's very important as well. That's been something that since I've been here at least uh, has been almost non-existent and uh, I do appreciate all the efforts that are being put in by you, by you, and, and all of the staff to provide more information. It is, it is helpful. Um, I, I agree with you completely on the timing issues. I, it would not be my preference to do things in this order. I would like for you to see the budget much earlier under normal circumstances. But as you know, we've had a lot of turnover in the finance department. We're playing a lot of catch up. So next year, I think we can do it the way that you requested. You can see the Fair budget enough. first and talk about revenues <laughs> later. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, Eric? I, I would support one aspect of what Mike said or reiterate one. I think that would be very helpful when we're presented with the increases to get an idea of to what extent they are driven by increased costs and to what extent they're driven by uh, a need for increased revenue. Uh, that, that uh, yeah, it would just be helpful. That, that's, uh, uh, that, that, that's really the essence of what these, these numbers mean. Charlie? Yeah, two, two questions here. So speaking of the budget <coughs> and whatnot, I, I'd appreciate getting a schedule um, for the budget, budget hearing and such. And then, of course, uh, hearing that you're going to do a little differently next year sounds pretty good. And we get, you know, it seems like some of this should be done simultaneously and started a month ago. Uh, that would be the way to do it. So related to the schedule here, w uh, the motion is essentially to put this on file for 30 days. Uh, is it a motion sufficient out of the out of the committee, or does it have to go to council to be put on file? I've, I've, you know, we've done this for years and years, and I forget which way we. I believe it goes direct. Uh, I think it's the committee sending it to the council. Right. The date for of June first. So oh, okay. people have plenty of time to ask questions about this. Okay, so that's it's why we do it this way, and it's required by state law. But I think we're giving ourselves a little bit more time than what's required. Okay, so the motion is to send this to council, but the motion, and, and then the to motion to forward is it to the council. To forward it to council, June first, twenty fifteen, for action. And for action. obviously, okay. it can be modified between now and then, and it can be modified on June first. Okay, well, I I make that motion. I'll second that. Okay, moved by Charlie and seconded by Dennis. Diane. But as I understand it, we won't see the proposed budget until June 1st. Is that correct? And then we don't have to approve this June 1st, but and that's why I asked for a schedule so that we can get it all as meshed okay. as we can. So on June 1st, we'll have the proposed budget and we'll be able to look at these fees in that context. Yeah, I, I okay. expect you'll have the proposed budget a few days ahead of that, but June 1st will be the first date that we'll discuss the budget. And is the proposed budget the one that the governor wants us to be considering, <laughs> or are we, I mean, what, what are you working with? What is the $2 million in it or not? Just curious. Um, it, so right now we're not dealing with what may happen with the state budget. As you know, um, we talked about our current budget situation and need, need, needing to take some actions to put that on a sustainable track. However, um, we are all, all of the department heads, aware of the potential um, for cuts from the state budget, and I guarantee you that every one of them is giving thoughtful consideration to how we might deal with reductions in state shared revenues. But we'll see on June 1st it, it will not include those, 50, the 50% 50 take back of the. Uh, no, no, if that's distributed. necessary, that would come later. That would come later, yeah. okay. Well, Eric? Uh, there is a minuscule a a likelihood, although I admit a minuscule likelihood, that the state will have done it, legislature will have done its business by June 1st. <laughs> <laughs> It's entirely possible. Uh, anyone else? Okay, it's been moved and seconded to uh, forward to the City Council Ordinance Number 2015-04-040, an ordinance amending 
Urbana City Code Chapter 14, Section 14-7 regarding schedule of fees, subsections B through P, titled licenses and permits. Uh, and this is excluding any liquor fees. Thank you. Uh, so all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay, and the ayes have it. So I'm actually only just the co-chair of this meeting tonight since I can't participate in <laughs> any of the rest of the agenda uh, <laughs> because as a local liquor license holder, uh, state law precludes me from participating in any discussion or action on liquor license related issues. So with that, uh, and with the committee's indulgence, um, I'll pass the gavel over to uh, Diane and uh, and leave if that's all right with you. <laughs> and I, I haven't seen my kid for. You five should be days. in time to see the second half too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get home before bedtime for the kid. We're going to pick up the pace here. <laughs> Okay, next on the agenda is uh, ordinance number 2015-04-041, which is an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 14, Section 14-7, regarding the schedule of fees for liquor licenses. Staff report. Uh, this is just a 1% uh, increase with a few exceptions, uh, increasing a few of the miscellaneous liquor fees and also the um, video gaming permit fee. So if there's any questions? Any questions for staff? Those liquor license fees are listed on page one of the schedule of fees. Charlie? I'll move to send this piece of the uh, schedule of fees to council June 1st with a recommendation for approval. I'll second. second. It's moved by Charlie, seconded by Dennis. Any further discussion? Okay. Do we need, let's see, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Uh, next up is ordinance number 2015-04-043, which is an ordinance amending the city code chapter 3, section 3-43, which is increasing the number of class 2 liquor G2 liquor licenses for SOILL restaurant systems doing business as Dotties, 2740 South Philo Road, Suite B. Mayor Pressing? Yes, this is one of the properties businesses that we had the hearing on and it will be followed by the other one so we went through all the discussion of creating this license and this would be the first one that we grant anybody have any questions about this particular one Could Dennis I, yeah um, Dennis yeah Mayor, I, I have a, a question about maybe um, g in general about the g2 approvals um, we're uh, offered a chance to evaluate each one individually and if we uh, uh, find that certain ones seem to us to be less advantageous do we need to f do we need to prepare some kind of like very specific um, reasons why we would want to reject the approval of a liquor license at a certain spot or are we, are we able to just to um, um, I mean, what is the what is the what does it behoove of us to have to um, bring to the council for um, approval or disapproval of any of these licenses? Well, I, I see our attorney is nodding that we do need specific reasons, so I'll turn it over to him. Whether you prepare the reasons in advance or somebody brings uh, their reasons to the committee and ultimately the council, uh, you do need to provide some specifics. Otherwise, uh, you have no basis on which to stand should that denied applicant claim that they somehow have been treated uh, improperly when compared to others. And I ask this because um, without, um, we're going to be looking at licenses appearing here and there throughout the city and I know that we have constituents who have either stronger or less um, concerns about the placement and I'm wondering what we can do because um, it sounds like now that we've established these this um, um, 
this, this classification. And uh, there is very, very little that anybody can say that would actually be sufficient to actually prohibit one from appearing in a neighborhood where there are concerns by the neighborhood uh, on the effect of the community. And I'm wondering if, the, if just the opinion of a, a group of neighbors is going to be deemed sufficient to uh, s consider seriously of um, denying a license. Because um, I see the potential that if there's not a way of the community itself to weigh in on this and request the license be denied, we will have a license approved every single time when it's brought to us. You have this exact same problem every time you're presented with a, an application to increase, whether it's restaurants or bars or, or what have you, or G1s or G2 licenses. Uh, the one benefit you have going for you is you have not approved a block of licenses for which one can apply. So the council can decide, but it should, if it's done properly and to protect the city, it should have reasons for deciding not to increase the number of licenses. Technically what you're doing is increasing the licenses in, let's say, this current case by one, uh, one G2 license, which would be there thereafter awarded to uh, this particular entity, Dottie's. Of course, the community can provide input. But you all, you will have the tape, the video of the public input. Uh, assuming the public input is rational, you know, that could provide a basis for denying. It just can't be arbitrary and capricious because, you know, a few people don't like a license when, you know, the rest of the community or the neighborhood has not shown up. I'm not suggesting numbers control, but there has to be a rationale. And the I don't like it, I don't think is a, would be a sufficient rationale. Uh, so um, it, does there need to be a number of people who uh, disagree that uh, where it becomes fine, not, not just an opinion, but a, uh, a valid concern of a community? Well, I, d I don't know what, you know, whether it's a particular number, whether it's 2 percent or 90 percent of a particular community or what the <coughs> definition of that particular community would be. But well, the council is going to have to come up with a rationale for denial. So uh, that's my problem with this whole process, that the only rationale that we seem to have is whether they're far enough away from another G2 or G3, G1 license. And that is the only, only rationale that we're allowed, legally it sounds like, to stand on. No, it, it could be. That so that give, me, give me an example of what uh, would be a true the rationale. The that would business be may not be well funded. Okay. The business owners have a reputation uh, of not operating a professional you know, quality facility, whether it's in another community or what have you. Or maybe the layout of the space is not conducive, or maybe whatever uh, additional security that the state requires for these uh, licenses is not there. But I just think that any, any cogent gambling um, organization who wants to open up 1, 7, or 17 different uh, locations in the city, if they can find the locations to do it, will proceed to do so if they wish to. And there will be very little that we can do to decide to cap them, unless we choose, perhaps as a city council, to enforce a cap. Because we, is that a valid thing that we say at this point we feel that there are sufficient uh, sufficient outlets for this business and we now vote to cap it. You can. You can okay. definitely say we don't want any more. The problem comes is when you say no to one and two months later another one, a different one applies and that one sails through the council and it's nearly identical to the one you just denied. So that's so when the problem, but that's, that's the benefit of you always have a cap on every one of these licenses right. and you can choose to increase them or not. Well, and, and, and you don't need a reason for, a real reason for deciding not to increase it, but the problem comes is when the next applicant applies, it's presented to you all and you then say, okay, well, we'll raise the cap for this one, but not the prior one. Well, and that's the, that's the loophole, that's the, uh, that's the Achilles heel of this entire process. Bill? Um, I guess I'll just, 
along those lines, I think each of us could have a different cap, and, and at some point we'll start each voting no, and when there gets to be four of us doing that, then nobody else will get one. Um, so that could be one way to cap it. Um, and then I think even in the event that we vote no, if somebody comes along and says, I want to open a movie theater with four screens, but I want to have a, a gambling parlay next door, I think that would be a, a big enough reason for that it would serve the best interests of the city where we might want to vote yes. And that would probably be legal because that would be an additional incentive. I, yeah, these things, and that's why this system is set up for all the liquor licenses, there has to be a look-see on an individual case-by-case -case basis of each applicant and all, and that's also why uh, Libby provided, you know, a relatively limited uh, zones in which these things can be located. Any other questions or comments? Just so the public is, is clear, this is for a G2 license, which would be for a uh, video gaming parlor where the majority of the revenue is, which is defined as where the majority of the revenue is defined from gaming rather than food or beverages. Um, did we, ha we had a motion, right? Second? No. We, is there a motion? I'll move to send this to council with a recommendation for approval. Is there a second? Wow. Well, I'll second. Okay. Could I comment on this? I mean, we went through a very extensive process of getting an ordinance passed, and we put in safeguards like having a public hearing. We had people testify. And um, I think there's a Th this particular business has been trying to um, open since last fall, and they've been patiently waiting while we did all the work that we did on the ordinance. Any further discussion? Motion by Eric, second by Diane. Bill? Um, yeah, I, I think this one um, on Philo Road, I will go ahead and vote yes for it. Um, I think. Part of the strategy was to provide enough opportunities for people that need to gamble to go ahead and, and have the places that they're comfortable gambling. Um, and I think this is one area and one type of, one type of gambling facility that we don't currently have. And if um, we don't have this one, they probably would go to Champaign. But I think for every one we add, it will encourage additional gambling and um, potentially problem gambling. And that's what worries me down the line but I plan to vote yes on this one. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, that passes. Next up is Ordinance 2015-04-042, which is an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 3, Section 3-43, or increasing the number of Class G2 liquor licenses for Trident Partners, Urbana 5.0, Commercial Center doing business as Ruby's 4 at 510 North Cunningham Suite number 5. Again, um, this is another business that has been waiting for us to complete the ordinance and they meet all the qualifications that we set out and we did have a public hearing on it and a couple of people who were in business um, did not want them because they said they were from um, out of town. So I didn't hear any other arguments against them, but that was the, what was stated at the public hearing. Eric? Um, I did hear other arguments, and I want to you know, make it clear that I'm considering those. Uh, one argument was by, by an individual who felt that the gambling establishment would be a, possibly a bad influence on, on youngsters whom uh, this individual was incentivizing actually through a cooperative program with Lee School uh, to come to his business and the other was by a restaurant uh, proprietor who was uh, going to have this um, come very very close and feared that uh, this was a, a level of this was a type of competition 
that um, you know was was in effect changing the rules. So uh, so those were cogent concerns. I am you know I've tried to think about sort of the 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 general impact of these establishments on the surrounding, on their surroundings, adjacent, uh, um, adjacent businesses. I guess the ones that that I have, um, you know, the ones that I've I've looked at online and and heard discussed and seen described. Uh, seem to be pretty innocuous in appearance and and so I'm not too concerned about the influence and I guess it's easy for me to say because I'm not the restaurant proprietor but I don't see a really direct competition between a restaurant that is primarily uh, whose primary draw is is food and whose secondary attraction is gambling machines, as opposed to a uh, uh, from a from a uh, from another establishment whose primary draw is gaming and secondarily serves food. So I I hope that I'm reading the situation right, but I think that these objections. I I think that. That we could approve this without um, without doing damage to the people who raised those objections. Dennis. Yeah. Well, um, these would be my constituents, and I feel somewhat duty bound to listen to their concerns. Um, I think they do raise questions that are um, worthy, and uh, although I may not agree with this in every single instance, I think in this time, in this instance, when they've come, when we have. We've had uh, businessmen come and people who are involved in the community come before us to um, to stress their concerns about it. I think, um, where, whereas in other instances nobody comes to speak forward at all, um, we have to at least honor honor the the input that we receive. So I'm not going to support this one. Any other comments? Is there a motion? For this ordinance, uh, apparently there's this will die for lack of a motion. Next up is Ordinance 2015-04-044, an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 3, Section 3-43, increases the number of Class G1 liquor licenses for Blackhawk Restaurant Group, LLC, doing business as Emma's, 114 North Vine Street, Suite 0. Okay, uh, Emma's got a liquor license uh, last fall as a restaurant. And that they have been, um, they're also going to have, they're applying for a G1. And this is where um, Quiznos was before, so that there is a full kitchen there. We asked them if they expect to uh, make the 60% on gambling, and they did not. But if they do, then um, we would ask them to change to a G2. But they did not expect to get to that point in the first year. So they already have an existing license, and normally we allow someone to keep the license until it expires, which would be um, the end of June. But they paid for this license um, back in November. And they've been waiting also until we got through our discussion on the licensing for video gambling. Charlie? Yeah, for some reason it's places doing other business are a little more palatable uh, regardless. Uh, the, uh, the question I have is sort of tangential to this. We have another facility that is also operating under a G1, but we suspect is really a G2. 
at what point do they get called in and, and asked for a G2? How do we move what? people from G1 to G2? And, and uh, you know, uh, what's going to happen when we say, well, we don't want G2s? or any more well, G2s. Well, we could discuss whether we want more G2s, but I think you should do it based on how the business has performed. But what we've done is say, um, if they already have a liquor license, we'll wait till that expires, and then we'll ask them to do a so G2. So the business I'm yeah. thinking of is going to be called in to, to look at it as a G2. Right, then. and then you'll be able, if, I mean, you could not give them a G2, but I think that that business has... Um, done very well. It hasn't created any problems. The customers like it, and it's created revenue for the city. But we can we will face that one um, in June. I think Jim wanted to address. I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we have a grandfather provision in the newly adopted ordinance that would grant them the G2. But I would like to say that um, if someone has a liquor license and we have a problem with them, we do take the liquor license. And that I've done that several times for businesses that have created problems. But this particular industry has created no problems. And I guess we have a gentleman who wants to talk. Yeah, this is, this is our Please our step, step up and speak into the microphone. State your name for the record. Uh, my name is Mike Thies, and I'm a partner with Blackhawk. Um, and as the mayor had mentioned, uh, we received this license, I want to say, in October or November. Um, and at that time, there was not a G2 designation. So we went ahead and submitted, uh, once we were built out, health inspection, um, the final forms for the G1. Um, and then clearly, if at appropriate time, you know, we would reapply or be grandfathered in at the G2. But we probably would not see that until... You know, our stabilization is probably 15 to 18 months. So, you know, they kind of track along, and then at some point, gambling will cross over from the uh, food and, and beverage sales. And at that point, obviously, there'll be a discussion on a G2. Um, so we stuck with the G1 because that's what we were granted previously. We know that we will not qualify for a G2 before June 1st, which, you know, obviously is quick. Um, so we're probably more at the mercy of you on what you think you should do if, if uh, I don't want to go for a G2 based on what just happened five <laughs> minutes ago, but I, I'm, I'm, if I'm grandfathered in, I want to stay with the G1 right now. So, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. You know, we're built out. We're just right down the street here on Vine near the Schnooks, about two doors at the Quiznos. Um, we have a store over in Champaign, two stores in Champaign was at our store in Champaign over in Baytown, and there was three people from Urbana in there, and their question to me was, when are you gonna be opening? I said, well, I'm going to a meeting tonight, so mm -hmm. hopefully that will be so. Jim? I'm not sure the grandfather would apply to you. We had a gaming hall uh, that, was in a, that became a gaming hall in existence before this uh, ordinance was set up. I think the, actually, the grandfather provision is for that entity. Okay, okay. And we don't have a problem coming back, you know, when that discussion takes place um, and let you know that for sure. Yeah. A lot of, I think, our delay with why we're here now in May was we were backed up with the state because we all know they're the most efficient government we've ever seen in our lives. <laughs> um, you know, we were backed up in the state from November and October, ready to open, but we're here now. Yeah, I, uh, I appreciate the fact that you've had, you've invested our, already a lot of money in that area and I support um, the license. Um, and, and actually, I think the fact that you had already gone ahead and invested that money and we saw you were ready to open is one of the things that prompted us to come up with a different licensing format so that we could uh, prevent people from investing a lot of money if we aren't going to approve the license. Um, and that's hopefully what we did with, with the previous one. <laughs> um, I did have a question about um, the percentage of sales. It seems like your other places are doing about a thousand dollars a day in um, gaming revenue so you're thinking that you'll be able to do about six to seven hundred in food it all depends today? every I, I, I every store is completely different um, some stores are eating stores and drinking stores some s stores really are mostly gaming stores so we have some stores that that will be 30 to 40 percent food and liquor you know and then some stores that are 20 percent food and beverage so you know, to venture a guess, uh, you know, I don't know. I think at a certain point, probably 
late, like I mentioned, in 18th, 19th, 20th month, will probably be a G2 qualifier by the time everything gets said and done. If you just look at the normal track the way our other stores are. All right, thanks. And are you putting the five machines in? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any other questions? Charlie? Yeah, well, I think uh, the amount of food you sell corresponds to the quality of the food, so. Well, I eat that food all the time, so you should see what. Actually, kind of I, yeah. I did try a, um, a uh, is it Italian Italian beef like fold over sandwich. Oh, thing. the panini, the the panini, panini with uh, yeah, it yeah, was good. Yeah, was they're not, that's not bad. The yeah. chicken bacon ranch is. A I took it really home, microwaved it at home, but it was good. Did you? you the, what I really recommend is the uh, salted caramel brownie, pretzel crusted salted caramel brownie, which is really, <laughs> really. It's good. a good thing we had dinner. Um, I'll move to sentence the council. Second. Recommendation for Moved approval. by Charlie, seconded by Aaron. Are there any further questions or comments? Uh, Dennis? Yeah. Okay, so I walk by this one all the time because I live th two and a half blocks away. The fact that this has got a, a restaurant um, kitchen in it makes a world of difference to me. And whether it's going to be a viable kitchen or a, an ephemeral kitchen, we don't know. We'll get down to that decision later. But um, I can support G1s. Okay, and just for the public's information, a G1 is a liquor license that is for liquor sale in a business that has gaming machines, but the majority of the revenue would uh, be coming from food and beverage sales rather than uh, gaming. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Can, can can somebody what what would be the process? Do we do we self-report when we've crossed that threshold? Do we wait till the next renewal time? We will receive reports of food and liquor and uh, proceeds from the machines. The state provides right. that to us. When you cross over, I guess what is it, sixty percent? You then become a gaming hall, and then you have to apply and convert your license. No guarantees. Okay. Okay. So you'll call us in, I guess, is what I'm saying. Is what I'm asking. Presumably, yeah, somebody in finance will. You. you would notify us. Right, okay. Right. Once the collections come in and you. you right. Okay. And, okay. and I assume we'll let you keep operating. What? <laughs> well, I just didn't. I mean, <laughs> well, with the, with the June pending, renewal, yeah. I didn't know if, yeah. I, if we should be proactive, knowing that if it's May of next year to do it now, if we should wait until. I don't want to come back being called into the principal's office. I don't want to come back in a in a you know in a negative. I'd rather be proactive about you know letting you know when we think we're going to cross over or something like that. That's well. If you think you're going to cross over, just give us a call. But we'll we're going to keep track of things. Okay. Because it, these are it's public information. No, I understand that. Yeah. No, every, we all know you can check the internet on that stuff. So okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is ordinance number 2015-04-045, an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 3, Section 3-43, increasing the number of Class G1 liquor licenses for El Toro Incorporated, doing business as Toro Loco, 1601 North Cunningham Avenue. Again, this is an existing restaurant, and they want to add the video gambling, and they would qualify as a G1. We have never had any problems with this business, so I would recommend that you would approve it. Is there a motion? Aaron? I motion to move this to council for approval. Second. It's made motion made, moved by Aaron, seconded by Charlie. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? That passes. Last on the agenda is ordinance number 2015-04-046, an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 3, Section 3-43, increasing the number of Class G1 liquor licenses for Gemini Milo's, doing business as Milo's, 2870 South Bilo Road. This is a very nice restaurant <laughs> that's been in Urbana for a long time, and now they want to add Sorry. the video gambling and they would be a G1. <clears throat> they are primarily a restaurant. So again, we've never had any problems, um, so I would recommend that you approve it. Charlie? Move to send this to council with a recommendation for approval. Second. Moved by Charlie, seconded by Aaron. Any further discussion? 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? That motion passes. No further business being brought before the council. This meeting is adjourned.